Okay, uh, this is a video on section 10.7. Uh, once upon a time in the beginning, I know I did, I'm sure Mr. Walsh did, uh, promised you guys that there were actually multiple theories about how atoms come together and bond to form molecules. And so, um, we're going to look at the final theory, which is known as molecular orbital theory, and that's section 10.7. So, to your right, what you see there is a sample of liquid oxygen that is actually being poured between the uh, ends, two ends of a magnet. Um, experiments show that oxygen is paramagnetic. So, there's the oxygen being poured through. And you recall that paramagnetism means that it is affected by a magnetic field, so it's actually attracted by a magnetic field. The problem is, though, is if you look at present bonding theory, and particularly hybridization for the oxygen molecule, you would find that there are no unpaired electrons. And go look at the hybridization in oxygen. Think about it. Think it through. See if you can figure out the hybridization. You'll see that there are no unpaired electrons in the oxygen molecule. So you would think that the oxygen molecule would be diamagnetic, but experimentation shows that it is really paramagnetic. So my friends, Obviously, the hybridization theory can't really explain this paramagnetism that oxygen displays. And so, we need a new theory. So, we get one. And it's called molecular orbital theory, as we said. Bonds are formed from the interaction of atomic orbitals to form molecular orbitals. So, instead of an overlapping of atomic orbitals, my friends, which causes... Um, you know, just an overlap of those orbitals and you get the bond. What's happening is the orbitals are actually overlapping, but not just overlapping, but forming new mo uh, orbitals, which are actually part of the molecule itself. So instead of the orbitals remaining part of their individual atoms, the orbitals overlap and become a total of the molecule or a part of the molecule. So the wave function of that electron has to change. And so it becomes a molecular wave function as opposed to an individual atomic wave function. Um, <clears throat> for the simplest molecule, hydrogen, let's look at what happens when the orbitals overlap to form molecular orbitals. Um, here we have the two 1s orbitals of the hydrogen overlapping. And what happens is this. When they overlap, there's a constructive interaction between those two orbitals, and we get a bonding orbital that looks like this. We see that there's a great deal of electron density that is in between the two nuclei. So if the electron density exists on a line between the two nuclei, where there's lots of electron density around that line, we call that a sigma molecular orbital. In this case, because the interaction is constructive and the electron density is between the two nuclei, it's a bonding sigma molecular orbital. So if the electron density is around a line between the two nuclei, and if it's in between the two nuclei, then it becomes a bonding sigma molecular orbital. Here, we can also get, we get both of these now. It's not just one or the other. We get both. When they overlap, we also get some destructive interaction taking place. And so when the destructive interaction takes place, the electron density is, is all still or around a line that extends between the two nuclei. But now none of that density exists between the two nu nuclei. It's all around the individual atoms, and therefore this is known as an anti-bonding sigma molecular orbital. So it's sigma because the density is still around a line that is between the two nuclei, and it's anti-bonding because none of that electron density is in between the two nuclei. Okay, so there's like a node there. Your bonding orbital that is molecular has lower energy and greater stability than um, the anti-bonding molecular orbital. And your anti-molecular bonding orbital has higher energy and has lower stability than the atomic orbitals from which it ha was formed. 
and your bonding molecular orbital actually has lower energy and greater stability than the atomic orbitals from which it was formed. And, and so here is a diagram showing energy. Here's the atomic orbital of one atom. Here's the atomic orbital of the other atom. And we see that the molecular orbital, the sigma molecular orbital that's formed, that is bonding, has lower energy than um, the 1s of either one of these atoms. And the antibonding orbital has higher energy than the 1s of either one of these atoms that is formed. And we see that the two electrons from the 1s, they both go into the bonding sigma orbital. And in a minute, you're going to find out that that's a good thing. And it shows a stable molecule. So we see, if we think about the electron as being a wave, when the electrons overlap, we have two things that are going on. Because remember, this is a standing wave. And so portions of the standing wave are going to overlap. This is the wave of one electron. This is the wave of the other electron. And when they overlap, the sum of those two, because it's a constructive type of interference, increases the amplitude. And by increasing the amplitude, stabilizes the energy. Here, on the other end, we have another portion of the standing wave of the two electrons and they're out of phase, right? These guys are 100% in phase, these guys are 100% out of phase, 180 degrees out of phase, and so they will actually interfere with each other and cause a destructive interference. And so the amplitude goes to zero, and we see why this orbital has a, has a higher energy state. And then the atoms orbitals that, it, or the orbitals of the atoms that it came from, and this one has a lower energy state than the atomic orbitals from which it comes from. Okay, I'm going to skip over this a little bit, okay, and I'm going to skip over this one a little bit, I'm going to go back to both of them, I'm going to skip over that one, and I'm going to go to this one. Molecular orbital configurations. Now, we saw back in this, um, this one right here, which is, you know, very small, it's only hydrogen. Um, this is what's called a molecular orbital configuration. So it's basically how the molecular orbitals are configured from the atomic orbitals and where the electrons go. So this is a very simple case. It's hydrogen and again all we can form is the sigma bonding and the sigma non-bonding or anti-bonding and we can see that the electrons go into the sigma bonding which is as we said before it's a good thing. So how does one construct one of these orbital diagrams from, say, not just 1s orbitals, but from 1s orbitals and 2s orbitals and 2p? Well, we're going to go over some rules, and basically then we're going to go over some um, examples. So the first rule of, of coming up with a molecular orbital configuration is that the number of molecular orbitals formed is always equal to the number of atomic orbitals that are combined. The more stable the, the bonding molecular orbital is, the less stable the corresponding antibonding orbital is. The filling of the molecular orbitals proceeds from lowest energy to highest energy. And you can see that's why we put those two electrons when we did the hydrogen. That's why we put those two electrons in the bonding orbital. If we had more electrons then after we filled the bonding orbital, which of course can only have two electrons like an atomic orbital, we would go up and put those electrons in the antibonding orbital. Each molecular orbital can accommodate up to two electrons, which we said. Use Hund's rule when adding electrons to the molecular orbitals of the same energy. All right? So we have to put one in each before we can put two in one. And the number of electrons in the molecular orbitals is equal to the sum of all the electrons in the bonding atoms. So for every one electron in the, in the atomic orbitals, you have to have the same number of electrons in the molecular orbitals. Okay, so these are some small molecules like the hydrogen molecule and what we're showing here is the orbital configurations for the 1s because these molecules that we're about to talk about the H2 plus molecule, the H2 molecule, the He2 plus molecule and the He2 molecule. So that's the H2 plus molecule, the H2 molecule, the H2, He, excuse me, 2 plus molecule, 2, He2 plus molecule, and the He2 molecule. These are very simplistic molecules, 
similar to just like a hydrogen molecule, things that you maybe hadn't thought about before, but we're going to show you whether or not that these things can actually possibly exist, whether they can or they can't. Some of them you might be surprised to find out that they can exist in others. Mm, less of a possibility. So how do we judge the probability of whether or not these things exist? Well, we do it with what's called the bond order. A bond order is something that can be calculated by taking the number of electrons in the bonding molecular orbitals, subtracting the number of electrons from the anti-bonding orbitals, and multiplying it times one half. So this would be the molecular orbital configuration for H2+. Now, these lines here would go down to the atomic orbitals, which are not shown in this diagram. So again, these lines would go down to the atomic orbitals. And you don't necessarily have to show the atomic orbitals. This would be sufficient. Uh, we see for an H2 plus atom that there's, or molecule, excuse me, that there's only one electron because it's H2 plus. So H2 actually has two electrons, and we take one away to make it H plus. And that one electron goes into this molecular orbital. And the molecular orbital, right, has one bonding electron and zero antibonding electrons. So one minus zero is one. One times one half is one. So H2 plus has a bond order of one half. For hydrogen, the bond order is one. So hydrogen has a bond order of one because there are two electrons in bonding molecular orbitals and zero in antibonding, and of course, becomes one half. For helium two with a plus charge, we have two bonding but one non-bonding, so two minus one 